That's where the egg. Remember this picture of the ovary from chapter 28 and all the different steps of what's going on in the 28 day cycle? On day 14 is ovulation. That's where the egg is released from the ovary and it goes into the fallopian tube. Then you also have sperm deposited in the vagina. So semen would be deposited here in the vagina. The sperm have to swim up through the cervix, through the uterus, into the fallopian tube, and up to this ovulated egg. Then the sperm will find the egg and one will fertilize the egg. Once an egg is ovulated, it's only good for about 24 hours. So this has to happen shortly after ovulation. So there is only this 24 hour window in each 28 day cycle when fertilization can occur. Now, when it comes to getting pregnant though, it's not just one day a month that sex can lead to pregnancy. The sperm can live for three days in the female reproductive tract. So if you have sex for three days before ovulation or the day of ovulation, fertilization can occur. So once an egg is fertilized, then it goes through meiosis too, so that then you get, if you look at the pictures here, there is a polar body. A fertilized egg goes through meiosis too. You get, there's your second polar body, and then you get a mature egg and a sperm. They fuse into a zygote. So a zygote is one cell that is an egg plus a sperm fused together. Now you're back to having that full 46 chromosomes because the egg had 23, the sperm had 23. Now you're at your full 46 chromosomes. And it typically takes about 10 to 20 hours for sperm to make the journey up to the egg. So this will happen several hours to the next day after sex. Then the zygote begins cell division. And this is a special type of cell division called cleavage. So you can notice the number of cells is increasing. You start with one, then two, then four, then eight, and so on. So you double the number of cells. So now you do mitosis and you make more cells. But look at the size of the cells. Their cells are not growing. So you start off with two large cells, then you get four cells that are a little smaller, eight cells that are a little smaller. With each division, the cells get smaller. 
So you're making more cells, but there is no growth. This is cleavage. So you spend about one week traveling through the fallopian tube and doing cleavage. By the time it reaches the uterus, so right here, this blastocyst stage, which you can see is right here when you reach the uterus, then you have about 200 cells. So a blastocyst is about 200 cells that reaches the uterus. And you can see the cells have split into two groups. You have a trophoblast and an embryoblast. Trophoblast is the outer cells. So there are all these kind of pinkish ones here. they will develop into the placenta. Part of the placenta is made by the mother, part is made by the embryo. This is the part of the placenta that's made by the embryo. Then you have the embryoblast. These are the cells that will become the embryo. So this is these blue cells here on the inside. That's the embryoblast. Then this blastocyst you can see here and plants in the wall of the uterus. And it takes about a week or so to get fully implanted. So we've covered two weeks now from the time of fertilization until you have a fully implanted blastocyst. Once it's fully implanted, then it's called an embryo. Before this time, it can either be called pre-embryo or conceptus. So from fertilization to implantation, It's called a pre-embryo or conceptus. At this time, once implantation is complete, that's when the embryo will start to secrete HCG. So we mentioned this hormone in chapter 28. That's human chorionic gonadotropin. This hormone goes to the ovary and it keeps that corpus luteum alive. So once you have an implanted embryo, it secretes HCG.
HCG keeps the corpus luteum alive, or it maintains the corpus luteum. And then the corpus luteum will continue to secrete estrogen and progesterone. And estrogen and progesterone will cause the uterus to maintain the endometrium. And as long as the uterus maintains the endometrium, you keep the embryo. And it is at this time now that the woman will notice a missed period. And that's when she could have her first clue that she's pregnant. And remember, this is two weeks after fertilization occurred. So until you hit that two weeks after fertilization, there's no way to know if you're pregnant or not. You have to wait that two weeks. When it comes to calculating gestation times, there's a couple of different ways to do it. Biologically, pregnancy is considered to begin when implantation occurs. And this would be two weeks after fertilization. And if you go by this count, pregnancy lasts 36 weeks. Doctors use a completely different system. Doctors like things they can know. Most women cannot tell you the date that fertilization occurred. So doctors start counting with the first day of the last period because most women can tell them that date. So doctors actually start counting the pregnancy two weeks before fertilization even occurs. So if you use this count, pregnancy is 40 weeks. If you want to count just from fertilization to birth, That time is 38 weeks. So from conception to birth is 38 weeks, but doctors add an extra two weeks on. They start counting from the first day of the last period and say that it's 40 weeks. Another thing that can happen during fertilization is you can get twins. Twins can be fraternal or identical. So monozygotic is identical twins. This is when you have one egg, one sperm, you get one zygote. That's why it's called monozygotic. So you have 46 chromosomes here. You get one embryo with its 46 chromosomes. Then the embryo splits. So you had 46 chromosomes here. That splits and you have the same 46 chromosomes in each of these. So you get two babies that are 100% genetically identical. They have the same 46 chromosomes. So these babies are going to be the same sex and they are going to look alike. 
Now, there can be small differences because environment matters, and they're not always necessarily the same size because one of them might be in a position in the womb where it gets more blood from the placenta than the other, and the one that's getting the better blood supply will be bigger than the one getting the less blood supply. Then you can have fraternal twins or dizygotic, so di means two. This is when the woman releases two eggs. And each egg is fertilized by a separate sperm. And so in this case, each zygote has a different 46 chromosomes. And so you get two babies born that are just like any other two siblings. They can be the same or different sex. And genetically, they don't have any more in common than siblings who were born several years apart. They just happen to be born at the same time. And then there are exceptions. So for example, with the monozygotic twins, the identical twins, it doesn't have to stop at two. That embryo can keep splitting over and over. You can get triplets, quadruplets. You can even get quintuplets. This picture is a set of five identical girls who were born in Canada in 1934. There was no fertility treatment, nothing going on. Just that embryo kept splitting and splitting, and you ended up with five babies, all with the exact same genes. And when it comes to the fraternal twins, the dizygotic, because each egg is fertilized by a different sperm, it's actually possible for the twins to have different fathers. Because remember, sperm can live three days inside the female reproductive tract. So if a woman has sex with two different men during the three days before she ovulates, then there would be two different sets of sperm there, and it's a 50-50 that each egg could be fertilized by a different man's sperm. So there's a movie in which, from the 1980s, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito are fraternal twins. And although that might sound kind of weird for humans, in the animal kingdom, in some species, that's the norm. Like cats, for example, if you've ever had a cat have kittens, you might notice that the kittens look very different from each other because it's normal for cats to have each kitten in the litter have a different father. Just helps you give more gen genetic diversity that way. By week three, that blastocyst that implanted in the uterus has developed into an embryonic disc. So it has become the embryoblast, not the trophoblast, but the embryoblast has become this flattened disc. And the cells of the embryoblast have split into three types. And these three types of cells form layers. And you can see they're color coded for us here. The top layer in blue is the ectoderm. The middle layer in pink is mesoderm. And the bottom layer 
and yellow is endoderm. Then this disc folds. So in week four, this flat disc of three different types of cells folds and it starts to take on a three-dimensional shape. So we have two types of folding. This one is caudocephalo or cephalocaudal folding. And the other one is transverse folding. I'm going to use this paper to demonstrate how embryonic folding works. You have two types of folding. Cephalocaudal and transverse. Ceph means head and caudal means tail. So in cephalocaudal, one each end folds up like this toward, toward the middle. And that is how you get the head and the butt. Transverse folding happens along the long axis. So in transverse folding, each side comes together and meets in the middle. Notice I have an R and an L on here. That's for right and left. That's how you get your right and left sides. And this little spot under your nose, the philtrum, that is where, that's the seam, where your right and left sides met in the middle there. So as you can see, those folds give it the head, the butt, the right, and the left. And at the end of four weeks, this is what an embryo looks like. So this is an embryo at four weeks after it has folded. And when it comes to that transverse folding, it doesn't always work out perfectly. So remember I said the philtrum, that seam that's under your nose, is from that transverse folding where your right and left meet up. So a cleft palate and a cleft lip is when the transverse folding doesn't fuse together right. And this needs to be surgically repaired. Babies who have this have a hard time swallowing because your palate, the roof of your mouth, it's very important. It separates your mouth from your nose. This allows you to breathe and chew at the same time. Now, babies aren't chewing. But they do drink their milk. And they have to be able to breathe while doing so. And if there is a hole in the palate, that interferes with their ability to breathe and drink their milk. So then once that embryo is at this four-week stage right here, now it's ready to start developing its organ systems. So the next thing will be to develop organ systems. So those three layers of cells are going to make different organ systems. So this picture is showing you what comes from each of the layers. So again, the blue is our ectoderm. And you can see it's going to form the nervous system. You've got the brain, the nerves there. The pink, remember, was the mesoderm. 
and you can see it forms the muscles, the bones, the heart. The yellow is our endoderm. And this forms the digestive system, the respiratory system. Notice that these structures are tubes. Your digestive system is a tube that goes from mouth to anus. So that comes from the endoderm. So the next four weeks are spent developing those organ systems. And then this is what the embryo looks like at the end of eight weeks. At this point, all organ systems are formed. And this is the end of embryonic development. So embryonic development is about making the organ systems. And once they're made, embryonic development is complete. So the rest of the pregnancy will be fetal development. So fetal development is going to be about getting bigger and the organ systems begin to function. So at eight weeks, the organ systems are there, but they're not functioning yet. That comes along in fetal development. One of the other important things that's developing during the first 12 weeks of pregnancy is the placenta. The placenta has two parts. Remember we talked about the trophoblast. From the blastocyst, those outer cells, the trophoblast forms the fetal part of the placenta, which is called the chorionic villus. So I'm going to outline it here in purple. It's this thing that kind of looks like a tree. So everything here in purple is the fetal part of the placenta. And remember, those are made from those trophoblast cells that we saw in the blastocyst. And these structures, and there's several of these, this is just a picture of one, but it forms all these tree-like structures, these projections called chorionic villi. Then you have the maternal part. So the mom also makes a part of the placenta. So all of this out here that's surrounding the chorionic villus is the maternal part. So the point of the placenta is it brings the mom's blood and the fetal blood very close. So the blood vessels that you see here inside the chorionic villus are fetal blood. And the blood vessels that you see up here are maternal blood. So the placenta brings mother and fetal blood very close to each other. Now, under normal conditions, they don't mix. They just get close enough to do diffusion. So they exchange substances with each other. So now think back to chapter four when you learned about diffusion. 
Diffusion is the movement of a substance from high to low concentration. And we're moving stuff back and forth between the mother and the fetus based on diffusion. So a couple of examples. We want carbon dioxide. The fetus is making carbon dioxide, but it's not breathing. There's no air in the womb. So we need to move carbon dioxide from fetal blood into maternal blood. So that means we need the fetal blood to be the high concentration, and we need the maternal blood to be the low concentration, so that diffusion will move from high to low. So we have to make the maternal blood low in carbon dioxide. This way it will draw the carbon dioxide from the fetal blood. So the way you do that is to breathe more. Every time you breathe, remember we've talked about this before, every time you breathe you lose carbon dioxide. So pregnancy hormones will stimulate the mother to take more breath. She's going to have a faster breathing rate. And if you increase your breathing rate, you lose more carbon dioxide. So one of the effects of pregnancy hormones is to stimulate the mother to have a faster breathing rate. That way she loses more carbon dioxide and then that will cause her blood to be low in carbon dioxide, which will set up the gradient for diffusion to draw carbon dioxide out of the fetal blood. Another example is nutrients, and especially glucose. The fetus needs glucose, so we want it to move from the mother to the fetus. So remember, we move high to low. So this means we want the mother to have high glucose so that it will move into the fetus where it's lower. So we're going to alter the mother so that she maintains a higher blood glucose. So the pregnancy hormones, you may have heard of insulin. Insulin is the hormone that regulates your blood glucose. Pregnancy hormones suppress insulin. So a pregnant woman will have less insulin. And insulin is the hormone that regulates your blood glucose. So if you have less insulin, your blood glucose is higher. And then this again sets up that gradient for diffusion. Because the mother's blood glucose is high, more will move to the fetus. In fact, a side effect that you see of this is diabetic women tend to have very large babies. The reason diabetics have such large babies is because if you're diabetic, you have that high glucose, and so much glucose goes into the fetus. So they actually have too much glucose goes into the fetus. And it will stimulate that fetus to kind of overgrow. So it's typical for a diabetic woman to have a 10 or 12 pound baby. Another important function of the placenta is making hormones. So the placenta does this diffusion with mother's blood. It also makes hormones.
So let's tie into some things you've already learned before. Remember that the corpus luteum, that's the remains of the follicle after ovulation. Remember that this secretes estrogen and progesterone. And that estrogen and progesterone stimulate the uterus to maintain the endometrium. Then remember when you have implantation, so see right here, implantation, the embryo secretes HCG. So this orange line is HCG. HCG maintains the corpus luteum. So without HCG, the corpus luteum would die, it would turn into a corpus albicans, estrogen and progesterone drop, and the uterus sheds its lining. But during pregnancy, you don't want that to happen. So the implanted embryo secretes HCG, it maintains the corpus luteum, so then it continues to secrete estrogen and progesterone, and the uterus keeps the endometrium. So in order to maintain a pregnancy, you have to maintain high levels of estrogen and progesterone. If at any time the estrogen and progesterone drop, the uterus will shed and you would have a miscarriage. So in order to maintain the pregnancy, it's very important to keep estrogen and progesterone high. So, so far we've been relying on HCG from the embryo. That happens for the first 12 weeks. So for 12 weeks, the embryo is responsible because it secretes HCG, which then maintains the corpus luteum, which secretes the estrogen and progesterone. So the embryo is keeping itself there by secreting the HCG to keep the corpus luteum, to keep the estrogen and progesterone. But then at 12 weeks, the placenta takes over. And it relieves the embryo of that responsibility. So you can see right here, placenta is now the main producer of estrogen and progesterone. So now you can let the corpus albicans or the corpus luteum turn into a corpus albicans. So you can see right here at that 12 week mark is when the HCG drops. So now the embryo no longer has to maintain that high level of HCG and you go ahead and let the corpus luteum turn into a corpus albicans. And so it no longer secretes estrogen and progesterone. But that's okay because now the placenta makes all the estrogen and progesterone. And then 
the uterus still maintains the endometrium and maintains the pregnancy. So there are some of the basic functions of the placenta. It's doing diffusion between mother and fetal blood, and starting at 12 weeks, it takes over the job of making estrogen and progesterone in order to maintain the pregnancy. Now we're ready to look at fetal development. So we know that the embryo takes nine or takes eight weeks to form. And we know that the placenta takes 12 weeks to form. Now from weeks 9 to 38 is fetal development. And remember the different ways to count weeks. This is counting weeks fertilization to birth. A doctor would call this time period weeks 11 to 40 because they add on the extra two weeks because they count from the first day of the last period. Remember we talked about that in the first video. But we're gonna go with the biological definition weeks nine to 38. So at week nine, you have the organ systems are there, they have formed. So they're present, but they're not functioning. And the fetus is very small. At nine weeks, the fetus is typically nine centimeters long and about 28 grams. So nine centimeters is gonna be roughly three inches. 28 grams is about what an egg weighs. So that's what you have at nine weeks. Then you spend fetal development, growing and gaining function of the organ systems. So that then by week 38, you have a full size fetus ready to be born. So it's full size and functioning and ready for birth. So a full term fetus at 38 weeks is gonna be about 36 centimeters long. And that's crown to rump. So they don't count the legs. They measure head to butt, crown to rump. And the weight is going to be, and it varies a lot, but about 2.5 to 4.5 kilograms. So there's the remainder of development. Then next we'll look at birth. Once the fetus is full term, then it's ready to be born and the process of labor can start. Nobody knows for sure exactly what makes labor start, but once it does start, it is a positive feedback cycle. So we can go through this cycle of what happens. You have the mom's hypothalamus stimulates the posterior pituitary to secrete oxytocin. Oxytocin stimulates the uterus to contract. When the uterus contracts, the fetal head hits the cervix. This causes the cervix to open a little bit.
but it just opens a little, not all the way. And when the fetal head hits the cervix, the cervix sends a signal back up to the hypothalamus telling it that it's been hit. So now we've gone full circle. So now we're ready for round two. So then in round two, in response to this signal from the cervix, the hypothalamus stimulates the posterior pituitary to secrete even more oxytocin. This higher level of oxytocin causes a stronger uterus contraction. That stronger contraction causes the fetal head to hit the cervix even harder. This causes it to open even more. It also causes the cervix to send a stronger sensory signal to the hypothalamus. In response to this stronger signal to the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus then stimulates the posterior pituitary to secrete even more oxytocin. And that causes a much stronger contraction in the uterus. This causes the fetal head to hit the cervix much harder. This causes more opening of the cervix and an even stronger signal up to the hypothalamus. So you should see the pattern by now. The labor is positive feedback. You keep going through this cycle and with each turn through the cycle, it gets stronger and more intense. So labor starts off mild. Early labor can just feel like minor cramps. and they might be 20 minutes apart. But as it progresses, the pain gets more intense. The pain is from the uterus contracting. And the contractions get closer together. So you have less time between contractions. And this continues until the fetus is expelled. So there are two things being accomplished during labor. One of them is effacement and the other is dilation. Effacement is thinning of the cervix. Okay, so here you can see this is before labor. And the cervix is thick. So, or you can kind of think of it as it's tall. So all of this is the cervix. Here's at the end of labor.
the cervix is thin or it's short. It's only right here. So effacement is thinning of the cervix. And it is measured in percentages. You can see it's 0%, there's 50%, there's 100%. And it's normal to be partially effaced before labor even begins. The second thing is dilation. This is when you actually open the cervix. So let me do a different color here. See this gap right here? And there you see that gap? That's dilation. Dilation is when the sides of the cervix separate from each other. and it opens up all the way around a circle. So here's showing the dilation, these circles. You can see the cervix opens up, the sides spread apart from each other. And you have to get to 10 centimeters. So 10 centimeters is fully dilated. Once this point is reached, then it's time to push. And to give you an idea of 10 centimeters, it's about the width of your hand. So a hand is about 10 centimeters. Then you have the three stages of birth. So stage one is labor. That's what we just talked about. That's where you have oxytocin, stimulates the uterus to contract. And the fetal head hits the cervix. And causes effacement and dilation. Also during this time, the water breaks. So what that means is the amniotic sac full of amniotic fluid breaks. And if you remember back in chapter 6 when we talked about meconium, how a fetus's hair falls out and the fetus eats it and they get that first poop that's meconium, when the water breaks, they check the amniotic fluid to make sure there's no meconium in it. Because if there is, then that can get into the baby's lungs and that can be very dangerous. The second stage of labor, or the second stage of birth is expulsion. So this is when the mother pushes the fetus out. A fetus should come out head first, face down. So you can see there the face should be down. If the fetus is flipped over so that they're face up, then the labor is inefficient because the angle makes the fetal head hit more against the lower back rather than against the cervix, and that's called back labor. And back labor is much more painful than regular labor, and it's slower because you're not efficiently hitting the cervix. So the fetus should come out head first, face down. And if they're in a different position besides head first, then that is breech birth. Then step three is delivery of the placenta. This is also called the afterbirth. So now that there's no more fetus to support, it's time for the placenta to come out. So after the fetus is out, then the mother's body will push out the placenta. Oh, yeah. 
All right, so there is what happens once the fetus is full term and it's time to be born. There are a couple of immediate changes in anatomy that occur once a baby is born. Remember, a fetus does not breathe. There is no air in the womb. So there are changes that occur once they're born and they start breathing. So before we get into the changes, let's review what you learned back in chapter 19 about the basic flow of blood through the body. So remember here we have the right atrium and the right ventricle. So you have deoxygenated blood from the body goes into the right side of the heart. It enters the right atrium and it passes from the right atrium into the right ventricle. Then the right ventricle pumps that blood to the lungs. And remember, it's going to go through the pulmonary trunk and the pulmonary arteries to get there. Then that blood picks up oxygen. Now we have oxygenated blood goes to the left side of the heart. It's going to go to the left atrium and then the left ventricle. And the left ventricle pumps that blood into the aorta. and then that blood is distributed to the body. So anyone who's been born and is breathing is doing this system. Deoxygenated blood goes to the right side of the heart, it pumps it to the lungs, it gets oxygen, comes back to the left side of the heart, which pumps it to the body. Now we can look at that same setup, but in a fetus. So in a fetus, there's no point in sending blood to the lungs. See, it says deflated lungs. A fetus is getting oxygen from the placenta, so they don't use their lungs yet. So you have to bypass sending blood through the pulmonary circuit to the lungs. So there are two structures that bypass the pulmonary circuit. The first one is the foramen ovale. So you can see that here. This is a hole between the right and left atria. So here's the right atrium Here's the left atrium. You can see blood from the inferior and superior vena cava go into the right atrium, 
but then instead of going to the right ventricle, it passes through that hole straight to the left atrium. The other structure is the ductus arteriosus. This structure connects the pulmonary trunk to the aorta. So this is the pulmonary trunk. Here's the aorta. So quite a bit of the blood will pass from the right atrium through the foramen ovale to the left atrium. Some of it will come down into the right ventricle. The right ventricle will pump it up into the pulmonary trunk, but from there, instead of going to the lungs, it goes through this special vessel, the ductus arteriosus, straight into the aorta. So those are the two ways that you bypass the lungs and avoid the pulmonary circuit while you're getting oxygen from the placenta. And when a baby is born on the first breath, so that very first breath they take after they're born, that foramen ovale closes. So you have this flap here, this flap closes and closes that off. And then the ductus arteriosus will work on disintegrating over the next few days. Every now and then you hear about a baby with a hole in the heart. That usually means that the foramen ovale didn't close. And doctors can tell they can hear the sound of the way the blood flows when that didn't close. So then they monitor it. It will usually close on its own within a few weeks. If it doesn't close on its own in a few weeks, then they can do surgery to close it. But in most cases, they just monitor it and it does eventually close up. Another thing that's different is the type of red blood cells. Remember, red blood cells pick up oxygen from the air in your lungs. But in a fetus, they're different. They have to pick up oxygen from the placenta. So fetuses have a different type of red blood cell. Fetal red blood cells are specialized for working with the placenta. Once they're born, then they have to get oxygen from the air. So they have to replace their red blood cells. and these are called adult red blood cells. So even though it's a newborn baby, there's still adult red blood cells that get oxygen from the air. So this means that a newborn has a lot of dead red blood cells.
because all those fetal red blood cells die. And remember, when red blood cells die, you get bilirubin. So we covered this in chapter 18. If you don't remember this, flip back to chapter 18. There's a whole page about red blood cells go to the spleen, they die, they're broken down, the heme is converted to bilirubin. Then the bilirubin goes into the blood and the liver filters it out and puts it in the bile. It's pretty common for babies to get jaundice. Newborn jaundice occurs because there is so much bilirubin that it can overwhelm the liver. And the liver just can't keep up, and so the bilirubin builds up in the blood. The good news is there's easy treatment for this. UV light is the treatment. It will break down that bilirubin. So if it's summertime and a baby has this, you can just go outside and sit in the sun. If the weather is not cooperating, they have these incubators with UV lights. So here's an incubator with the UV light. Or now they even have blankets with UV lights. And you can just wrap the baby up in this blanket and that UV will penetrate through the skin and break down the bilirubin. So there's a couple of things that are special to a fetus since they're not breathing and that change once they're born and they are breathing. So we saw the changes that occur in the fetus once they're born. Now let's look at some changes that occur in the mother after she gives birth. One of the changes that new mothers often notice is hair loss. They take a shower, they wash their hair, they see all this hair in the drain. They also may notice that there's a lot of hair coming out when they brush their hair. It is true that there is a lot of hair loss after pregnancy, but you're just going back to normal. So if you recall back to chapter six, there is a cycle of your hair. A hair will spend about two to five years growing. Then it will spend a few months dormant. Then you have about 100 per day fall out. And then you repeat the cycle. A new one starts growing in its place. During pregnancy, the hormones stop the going dormant and falling out. So while a woman is pregnant, she does not lose 100 hairs per day. So a lot of women notice that their hair gets longer and thicker during pregnancy. And most people attribute this to the vitamins, but it is not prenatal vitamins. This is due to the pregnancy hormones. So then, after you give birth, you lose those hormones. And those 100 hairs a day that haven't been falling out for the last nine months, now all fall out. 
So you lose nine months of hair all at the same time. So that's why it may seem like you're going bald. 100 hairs a day times the last nine months all of a sudden comes out. But really, you're just going back to normal. Another thing that happens is a lot of fluid loss. So during pregnancy, you tend to retain fluid. You can see this like in the swollen ankles and legs. There is greater blood volume. So women who are pregnant have more blood than when they're not pregnant. But then again, after pregnancy, you have to get rid of this extra fluid. And the body has several ways of doing this. You will sweat more. You will urinate more. There is also lochia. This is blood loss. It is like a heavy period. And it will last anywhere from a few weeks to a couple months. And that's a lot of excess blood leaving the body through the uterus. And a third thing that has to change is the size of the uterus. So during pregnancy, the uterus grew very large to hold that fetus. Now it has to shrink back to its normal size. And it does this through contractions. And these contractions can be painful. And they're called after pains. Everyone has a different experience, but some women say that the after pains hurt as bad as the labor pains. Another thing that happens while you're in the hospital is the nurses do a uterus massage. So it sounds like a nice thing when a nurse comes in and says, I'm here to give you your massage. It is not a nice thing. They need the uterus very forcefully, and it's very painful, and they're trying to get the blood and whatever remains pushed out of there and help it shrink back down. Then after birth, the mother also will start making milk. So milk production doesn't start until a few days after the baby is born. So the first few days, the baby gets colostrum. This is a thick yellow liquid. And it is full of antibodies. And so it is the first protection that that baby has against infection. So it's this big boost to the immune system to help protect that newborn from getting sick. And this colostrum is so important to the immune system that a lot of times, even if a mother is not planning on breastfeeding, they will encourage her to still do it for the first couple of days just to get that colostrum. Then after a few days, the milk comes in. This is maintained through a positive feedback cycle.
So the more you nurse, the more milk you make. And this, like labor, involves the hypothalamus and the pituitary. So we're gonna start here. When the baby nurses, the nipple sends signals to the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus stimulates both the anterior and posterior pituitaries. The anterior pituitary will secrete prolactin. And the posterior pituitary will secrete oxytocin. Prolactin stimulates milk production. So prolactin will come to the mammary glands and stimulate them to make milk. Now they're not making milk and the baby's immediately drinking that milk. What it's doing is it replaces the milk that the baby is drinking at that time. So when a baby starts nursing, the breast is full of milk, and the baby drinks that milk that's already there. But then however much milk the baby takes, the prolactin stimulates the replacement of it. Oxytocin causes milk letdown. This is when the milk is released from the breast. So without oxytocin, the baby wouldn't be able to get the milk that's in there. And other factors can stimulate this oxytocin. Every woman is different, but some women just the hearing, seeing, or smelling their baby can cause the oxytocin and milk letdown. So as long as the baby keeps nursing, you keep having prolactin to make new milk and the cycle continues. It's once the baby stops nursing, then you stop having prolactin and you stop making milk. Another interesting thing about the prolactin is it can serve as a birth control. Prolactin inhibits the menstrual cycle. Now, in our modern society, this doesn't always work. It only works if you maintain constant high levels of prolactin. So, in past times and in other cultures, when you would have women would basically wear their babies, they would strap them onto their body and the baby was always with the mother. And the baby would just nurse pretty much continually. It wasn't like every two hours, sit down, feed them for 20 minutes. It was just the baby would nurse for a couple of minutes, stop for a couple of minutes, nurse for a couple of minutes, stop. So the baby just nurses off and on all day, and the key is all night. It has to be 24 hours. Under those conditions, 
like the way it was for much of human history and the way it still is in some cultures, the baby is right there strapped to the mom, nurses off and on 24 seven whenever they want. And that will maintain those prolactin levels and that woman will not have a menstrual cycle and cannot get pregnant while she's still nursing that baby. But in our modern culture, this doesn't work because we have more of a program of you feed a baby once every two hours and you put them down in between times and that's not enough to keep the mom's prolactin level steady enough to inhibit the menstrual cycle. So there's some things that change with the mom after she's done being pregnant and gives birth.